Welcome to City Church YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Michael Anthony Stevens on the behalf of my wife, Pastor Sharon, and all of the saints and friends of City Church, Huntersville, North Carolina. We welcome you to another dynamic preaching, teaching broadcast. These next few moments promise to be a blessing in your life. and Perhaps it will be a blessing to those that you share this with. It is our endeavor, our dream, our goal, that you know more about the gospel, that is the good news of Christ Jesus. May his kingdom come and his will be done. I want you to sit back and hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says that God sent his word and his word healed them and delivered them from their destruction. I want you to know that there's nothing too hard for God. As you hear these sermons, as you hear the word of the Lord, whatever the situation, circumstance, dilemma, I want you to know one thing. There's nothing too hard for God. In fact, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And I just believe just the fact that you're here today listening to another great and dynamic sermon that God will bless, God will heal, God will deliver. We'll be back in a few moments. I want you to enjoy the word of the Lord. And again, thank you for joining. Once again, the book of Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, it is written in the law. What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm reading out of the new King James Version. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, and do this and you will live. But he, that is the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You all know the story. He fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed him, leaving him half dead. Would you say half dead? Now, by chance, as Jesus tells the parable, there was a certain priest who came down that same road. And when he saw him, well, he passed on the other side. Likewise, there was a Levite. When he arrived to that same place, he looked. But he also passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, hmm, as he journeyed where he was, the Bible says that when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him up on his own animal, brought him to an end, and he took care of him. On the next day, when the Samaritan departed, he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, uh, take care of this man and, and whatever you need to spend, I'll come back and I will repay you. And so Jesus, the Bible says, looks at the attorney and says, which of these three do you think was the good neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the attorney said, well, I imagine the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I want to continue on in this two-part series this morning, talking about becoming a people of deep compassion. Becoming a people of deep compassion. I sense right now in my spirit, the word to emphasize is mercy. The word that perhaps needs to be emphasized is mercy. Uh, Luke chapter 10, tomorrow we will celebrate a very significant holiday in our country and it is one that is recognized around the world. Tomorrow, all across America, will honor, will acknowledge, and will appreciate the life and the legacy of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he courageously, as you all know, and you know these things already, uh, he, he, he courageously gave of his life ministering and gave of his life serving our community, serving our people, serving the world for that matter. He demonstrated not just care and concern, but I believe that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man of deep compassion a man of deep compassion. Uh, not only did he make a difference in his generation in the 60s and uh, uh, the, the 50s and so on, but he's still making the same impact today. 
uh, there are three things that I think about uh, on this eve of celebrating uh, this great man and from our community, uh, three characteristics that I'd like to remind you all on today. Number one, Dr. King was a concerned civil rights activist. He was a concerned civil rights activist who made a difference for all. It is he who said, quote, it is a few of us that make it possible uh, for the rest of us. That's my passion for you today as volunteers in the church. It is today indeed a few of us. Come on, say a few of us. It is a few of us who makes it possible for the rest of us. Number two, he was a committed community leader who fought bravely the injustices of his time. He was a, a, a community leader who was committed. He fought bravely against the injustices of his time. He said, quote, it may get me crucified. And prophetically, he said, I might even die. But one had said that if I die, I'll die in the struggle that he died to make men free. He died to make men free. And here we are many, many, many years later celebrating not only the life, but the fact that indeed prophetically he did exactly what he quoted, that you and I would have more freedom. Third and finally, we see him as a caring Christian who had deep compassion. He was a caring Christian who had deep compassion. I want to talk about deep compassion today because Dr. King is gone and he's no longer here, obviously, but I believe that there are kings and priests, Revelations 1 and 6, inside of every one of us. Whether you are a stay-at-home mom, you are retired, you are a school teacher, a business owner, maybe you are in local politics, maybe you're in the military, maybe you're in corporate America, maybe you're in blue collar, white collar, whatever your circles of influences are, the Bible says in Revelations 1 and 6, that I have called you to both to the king and priest anointing. In other words, that yes, our involvement is inside the church as, as priests, but our, our impact should be outside the church as kings, all right? And, and not everybody has a platform of a pulpit outside the church that looks like this today, right? Uh, whatever your areas of influence, your areas of con contribution, your areas of leadership, you can walk as the king and priest that God has called you and I to be. Uh, being a community leader, excuse me, being a person of deep compassion as we began last week requires three things. And I'll remind you of this from last week. Number one, you have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to be aware, my friends, of your surroundings. In other words, we cannot be the proverbial ostrich who has his head head in the sand, sees no evil, hears no evil, knows no evil. You've got to eventually look up and see what's happening in your community. You've got to be able to look what's happening in your high school. Look what's happening in your neighborhoods. Look what's happening on your job. Look at the media. Read the newspaper. See and be aware of the things that we grapple and things that we deal with today. Number two, we have to be able to feel the pains of others. Be able to feel the pains of others. And I'll talk about this in a moment as we look back at the parable of Jesus. But I, I don't know if you can effectively minister to people if you don't feel their pain. And we don't like pain. We don't like trouble. We want pain to be for everybody else. We want to read their tabloids. We want to read the blogs. We want to read the newspapers. We want to read about everybody else's pain. But we don't want to go through no pain ourselves. Well, my friends, how will you ever experience the ministry and the comfort of others unless you yourselves have been comforted sometimes in those same things? You've lost a baby, but now you're right to minister to another lady who's lost a child. You lost, uh, unfortunately, a sibling or a loved one too early, too soon, but now maybe you can begin your bereaving care ministry and be around those who've lost loved ones. You want to minister effectively, but you have to be able to feel what people are feeling and feel at that time. Number three, uh, you're going to have to actually be able to have a plan and get the plan done. You're going to have to be a person who has a plan and can get the plan done. Last Sunday was a very unique Sunday, and I'm still trying to wrap my hand around last Sunday. I thought about the older men that we ministered to. I thought about sort of the target we drew, then shot the arrow, right? Um, uh, excuse me, shot the arrow first, then drew the bullseye around the arrow. We talked a lot about outreach. We talked a lot about missions. We talked a lot about, you know, hey, if we're really, truly going to make it a difference in this community, maybe it won't be the way it was in the 80s and the 90s. I grew up in an era where you built churches by big buildings and you built churches by concerts and conferences and conventions and guest speakers and big magazines and, 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 and all of the public media and, and, and those feel the platforms. You go, go back and think about those big, big mega churches of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, well, a lot of that is no more. A lot of those things have changed. 
Most of y'all grew up in an era where there were Sunday school buses all, all, almost in every corner. People went to big Sunday school classes. People picked up kids in buses. There were platform ministries that were huge. Things have changed in 2019. Now we don't have porches in the front anymore. You don't know who your neighbor is because you can sit on the front porch and talk to the people who sit on their front porch. Most of you all don't have a porch. You got a backyard deck that's enclosed by a privacy fence. And every once in a while you look over the fence and see how somebody's doing. Dynamics have changed. We can't be like the Southern Baptists who built mega, mega ministries by knocking on doors on Saturdays. Why? Because most people now live in gated communities. Whether you are an apartment, a condominium, or a home, you have to have a passcode to get inside the community. Used to be a time you could knock on someone's door and they'd open the door. Now, someone knock on your door, everybody get real quiet. Pull that shade down. What y'all want? You know I'm telling the truth. Hmm? And so things have changed. And I'm segueing to this message because it is a challenge ministering to our neighbors. It is a challenge knowing our neighbor. It's a challenge talking to our neighbor. There's so many things that have become divisive in our community. It is yet another challenge of knowing who our neighbors are. And how are we going to reach our neighbors if we don't know our neighbors? How are we going to minister to those who are struggling with identity, struggling in areas, if we don't know them? I say it all the time, and those who've been here long enough know this. Rules without a relationship will always breed rebellion. Say it again. Rules without a relationship will always breed rebellion. We have not earned the right to talk to those two husbands. We don't, we've not earned a relationship to minister to them until we get to know them and they get to know us and they're safe and opening up and talking. But taking a Bible and throwing it at them and condemning them to hell three times in a day probably won't open the door for you to sit down and minister to their hurt. We've lost the relationships with our young 13, 14, and 15-year-old young African-American men. Used to be a time you could grab them by the ear and bring them to church and sit down and be quiet. Now, they're liable to pull out a gun in their back pocket and tell you where you can go. So we're trying to put this context together that used to fit and it no longer fits. And so the challenges are mounting, but the gospel stays the same. We have to have a plan and we have to put it in place. I want to talk about that plan further in a moment, but, 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 but before then, let me remind you, God is a God of compassion. We too should be people of compassion. First Peter 3 and 8, and I read this last week, I want to read it again. It says, finally, all of you be of one mind, Peter says to the church, having compassion one for another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted and be courteous. Be courteous, right? What does it really mean to have compassion? Today we're talking about being a people of deep compassion. And let me remind you of what compassion really means, right? Compassion simply is, is, is to feel the passion with someone else. In fact, uh, to enter sympathetically into one sorrow, can you enter my pain? If you want to have compassion for someone uh, who's sitting on your row, are you willing to enter the realm of pain of what they're experiencing. Uh, compassion is this, uh, uh, to have sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others. But you got to have that concern with a plan in place. We're not just going to sit in a circle and woe is us, all right? It's not the goal to have small groups and everybody's defeated. Everybody's beat down. Everybody's broken with no hope. That's not compassion. That's misery. And y'all remember what mama taught us, right? Misery loves what? I know that's right. So compassion says we experience the misery, we experience the pain, but we have a plan to alleviate it. One of the joys I've had in going to Israel over the years is something called sitting Shiva. Sitting Shiva is when a family experiences loss or pain, and we come together and we sit in a circle. And whatever that family wants to do, we will do. They want to cry, we'll all begin to cry. 
If they laugh, we all begin to laugh. They want to tell jokes and have fond memories, we'll tell jokes and have fond memories. But it is a time of bereavement, and it is a time of showing compassion. You say, well, don't we do the same in our city? Well, we do, but we, we order food, we eat, and then the game's coming on at 4, so we got to get up out of here, and we got to leave. I cringe oftentimes at funerals because I don't know sometimes if we've got it right. I cringe when we are, when we should be mourning and weeping, we're trying to get our praise on. And when it isn't time to celebrate a home going, we spend too much time mourning. Sometimes the preacher takes an hour, hour and a half to get his sermon on because that's the only time he's going to preach as an associate reverend at somebody else's church. Uh-huh. Sometimes we take that moment to throw off on everybody else but the person who's in the grave. Uh-huh. And so deep compassion is having a plan to alleviate the pain. Second Corinthians, in fact, I want you to take your Bibles this morning, and I don't do this often, but go ahead and hold that Bible in your hand, right? And let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to talk to you about comfort and compassion. Comfort and compassion. My prayer this morning was, God, help me preach the gospel that everyone understand. And when it's all said and done, we take it back to the cross. We take it back to the gospel of Jesus the Christ. It starts with learning how to comfort one another. Uh, look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll begin at verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll begin at verse 3. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, hallelujah, is that right? And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Let's stop right there. Now, Paul talks to the church of Corinth, not one, but this is the second letter. And he says, you know what? God comforted you in your time of loss for a reason. And it wasn't that you bottle it, get a monopoly, and make a whole lot of money off of the comfort. The goal is that the very comfort you've received now you learn to comfort somebody else. When you were in your darkest moment and people surrounded you and loved on you, the goal would be that one day when someone else is in their darkest hour, you know with experience how to comfort them. My concern is that we are becoming a people of no compassion. We are becoming enamored, or excuse me, we are becoming callous, we are becoming desensitized to nothing really moves us anymore. Nothing shocks us. Nothing surprises us. Uh, nothing causes us to weep or to cry or, or to mourn. And that concerns me. I know what it's like to live a season in my life where I, 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 I didn't think it was bold to cry. Even as a pastor, you got to be tough. And everybody's crying and weeping, but you got to be the man of God by faith and be tough. And I'm not sure if that was a scriptural, biblical thing to do. And everyone wants a strong, valid leader. But are there weaknesses? Is there vulnerabilities? Do you feel what I'm going through with this foreclosure? Do you feel what we're going through with the divorce? Do you know what it's like to lose a loved one early? Do you know what it's like for a child to go wayward? And somehow or another, God allows every one of us to experience things in our lives that we don't want to experience. Why? Because he wanted you to be qualified to minister to somebody else. So the same comfort that we receive from the Lord, we minister and we care for other people. Two things we are launching in this season. I have to say this right now because if I, don't, if, if I don't preach this, I feel that I've not done you service. By faith, by faith, my prayer every day is, God, I need to do something today that pleases you by faith. Because if I don't do something by faith, the Bible makes it very clear in Hebrews 11 that, 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 that without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. Well, I better get on to finding something to do today that's going to require some faith. Because I want to please the Lord. And as I look at the challenges and the growth and, and, and the things that are associated with ministry, you know, I, I'm saying, God, how are we going to pay off this mortgage? How are we going to avoid foreclosure? How do we keep the lights on? How do we really impact this community? Because remember now, I'm coming out of the 80s and the 90s when I got saved. 
and you brought in the guest bishops and the guest psalmists and the guest singers and the international stars, and they'll fill the house at concerts and conferences. Then you have all these programs, really, that, that, that were entertainment-driven, and it worked. It worked in the 80s. It worked in the 90s. But right now, no one cares about prophet to so-and-so. That's not paying their bills right now. No one's concerned about certain tricks and games and gimmicks that feel real good on a Sunday, but it's not applying to my home on Monday. And so true faith says, go and do what Jesus said you should have done from the first place. Go to the poor, go to the homeless, go to the sick, go to the prisons, Go to the mental institutions and find the least of these. Jesus said, because when you've really ministered to them, then you've ministered to me. Yeah, but God, that ain't paying the bills right now. These are wonderful outreaches, and it looks real good in the newspaper. But we ain't raising no offerings. We're not raising 15 and 20 and 30 and 40 thousand dollars to pay the week's bills. It looks good, but they're not giving offerings. It's Toys and Christmas gifts. And, man, that is wonderful, but God, that ain't paying the bills. You, you've not had to sit where I sit. Oh, just have a free concert and encourage the people during the hurricane. Well, great, we're going to do it, but that concert artist wants some money. <laughs> and so now we have to be a church that reinvents, restructures, go back to the word of God and the just shall live by faith. Let me help you out with this one. The Lord spoke and said this. When you go after people nobody else wants, I will send people that everybody desires. When you make up your mind, you're going to minister to people that nobody else wants to minister to. Why? Because there's no, ret there's no ROI. There's no return on an investment. It's not practical. It's not profitable. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't make common sense, but it makes all the sense to Jesus when you can go after those that no one else has time for. May I be very transparent and very to the point? You know who does that really well? Our white friends. They know how to go into our communities, go into the mission fields. So what I'm saying is simply this. If God is in it, it's going to happen. God, we want to walk by faith. We want to do that which is most pleasing to you. Number one, we want to live holy. We want to live righteous. We want to live with integrity and character. Our knees have been broken. Our ankles have been broken. We've been humble. We've been broken. We've come back to ground zero. We've started over with rehealing and restoration and, and repair and, and regrowth. And, and, and God graciously and mercifully extends an opportunity. The Bible says that the Lord broke out against them because they did not do it the proper way. That's what the scriptures say. But then the scripture goes on to say, and now God comes to heal, to prosper, to increase, and to bless. You have to hold on long enough through the night to get through that season. And if you can make it through that season, there's nothing but greatness and increase and significance that's ahead. I want to say thank you again for joining us today at the City Church YouTube channel. What a joy it is to be able to come into your home, come on your laptop, come on your iPad, your cell phone. On the behalf of my wife, Pastor Sharon, and all of the saints and friends of the City Church, I just want to say thank you. You know, today I pray that something you heard in this message stirred your heart, provoked your faith, and blessed your soul. I believe with all my heart that God sent his word, and his word brings healing, deliverance, and breakthrough. Here's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to pray with you. I want you to know there's nothing too hard for God. In fact, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. The Bible reminds us that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And you know what? About 30 plus years ago, God came into my life as a freshman on an HBCU college campus. And I'm saved, sanctified, filled with God's precious Holy Spirit after all these years. Why? Because God's been faithful. He made a promise to his word, a promise to his covenant, a promise to me. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins, you say, Pastor Mike, I'm a good person. I'm really a nice guy. I'm a great girl, but I just don't know Jesus and the pardon of my sins. I'd like to pray for you. And after all of these years, I've often instructed 
that salvation is as simple as ABC. A, admit that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. B, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, three days later he rose again. C, commit your life, commit your heart to Jesus. After those ABCs, admit, believe, and commit. I believe that God comes into your life and you are a brand new creation, a brand new person in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I am a sinner and I want to get my heart right. I want to give my life completely to serving you. I do believe in my heart and I confess today with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, the living one. I want to commit my life to serving him and being all that I can be as a child of God. I receive today the gift of salvation into my heart, into my mind, into my soul, that my sins would be forgiven and that I will be washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit that I may be a brand new Christian. I thank you for salvation. Thank you that my sins are forgiven. Thank you for a brand new life. In the name of of Jesus we ask and we pray. Amen. My dear friend, you may not realize this, but that is the prayer of salvation. Again, it's a very simple process, simple prayer. Now, it will cost you to live this Christian life, but the Bible reminds us that greater is he that is in he, you, or greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Listen, if you're in the Huntersville, that is the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we'd love for you to visit us on Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. sharp, for a dynamic worship experience. If you can't be in the area, join us online, www.mycitychurchonline.com. All the information is on the screen. In fact, I'd like you to email me, write me. We want to send you some information on the decision you just made to serve the Lord. Maybe you're rededicating or recommitting your life to the Lord. We want to make sure that you can grow as a born-again, committed believer. Again, I can't thank you enough for allowing us to be in your world on this day. May heaven smile upon you, and may the Lord richly bless you. I'm Dr. Michael Anthony Stevens. On the behalf of all of the saints and friends of City Church, we say welcome Congratulations and God bless.